Mahmoud Sarhan went to the Cairo Zoo and he was shocked when he took a close look at the two zebras who lived there. Sarhan knows something about zebras and he knew that these two animals were not zebras. They were donkeys with black stripes painted on. He posted a picture of these phony zebras on Facebook. It went viral. People started to weigh in on their authenticity and a local news team contacted a veterinarian who claimed that zebras usually have a black snout and that they have uniform stripes on, on their bodies. But these donkey zebras in the Cairo Zoo had crooked stripes and black smudging around their nose. Now, the zoo director insisted that no, these are real zebras, but the proof is in the smudging and in the striping. They're a couple of painted run-of-the-mill donkeys is what they are. Now, had Jesus owned a camera, I wonder if he would have taken some pictures of the scribes and the Pharisees, posted those pictures on Facebook, and then wrote a caption that read, these may look like spiritual leaders, but look closely. Their righteousness doesn't come from the inside, it's painted on. What we see on the outside doesn't always tell the truth. That's true of donkeys painted to look like zebras, and it's true of hypocrites painted to look like Christians. I invite you to open your Bible this morning to Matthew 23, verses 1 through 12. That's page 878 in the Pew Bible that's in front of you. And if you're here today and you don't have a Bible with you, use that one. Get God's Word in your eyes as well as in your ears today. And if you don't own a Bible, take that home with you. Begin reading in a place like Matthew and learn more of Jesus. Matthew 23, 1 through 12, our text finds us in Passion Week. Just a few more days, Jesus will be hung on a cross. He does a lot of teaching. In the temple area that last week, he fields a lot of trick questions from religious leaders who are trying to trip him up, trying to make him look bad, to expose him as a blasphemer or as a, or as a lawbreaker or even as a kook. It's not working. Jesus' answers tend to make the Pharisees look bad. They have been in conflict with Jesus since he began his ministry. Why should this last week of his life be any different? But Jesus had as much as he was going to take. So call it preaching, call it meddling, but Jesus exposed those scribes and Pharisees for who they are in their heart of hearts, and it's not pretty. I invite you to hear the word of the Lord. Then Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples. The scribes and the Pharisees are seated in the chair of Moses. Therefore, do whatever they tell you and observe it, but don't do what they do, because they don't practice what they teach. They tie up heavy loads that are hard to carry and put them on people's shoulders, but they themselves aren't willing to lift a finger to move them. They do everything to be seen by others. They enlarge their phylacteries, lengthen their tassels. They love the place of honor at banquets, the front seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplaces, and to be called rabbi by people. But you're not to be called rabbi because you have one teacher, and you're all brothers and sisters. Do not call anyone on earth your father because you have one father who is in heaven. You are not to be called instructors either because you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Now we're going to stop there. But Jesus is just getting started. In these first 12 verses, he's talking to the crowd and to the disciples He's teaching hypocrisy 101. But starting in verse 13, Katie bar the door. Jesus speaks directly to the scribes and the Pharisees in a series of seven woes. And if you think that Jesus is this really nice guy, really sweet man, then that opinion is going to be shattered when you read the rest of chapter 23. Jesus does not mince words here. Too much is at stake. There's a basic principle in leadership when confronting a person about a serious matter. Leaders do not stop at 95% of the conversation that they need to say. Leaders will say the last and usually the most painful 5%. Jesus gives the scribes and Pharisees all 100%. I mean, listen to the names he calls them in the rest of chapter 23. Sons of hell, blind guides, Blind fools, 
cups that are clean on the outside but filthy on the inside, whitewashed tombs that are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness, not to mention snakes and a brood of vipers. But the name he called the most is hypocrite. Some six times in chapter 23, he calls them hypocrites. Now, if I'd have called people names like that, sons of hell, snakes, whitewashed tombs, blind fools, my mama would have washed out my mouth with soap. But I did that once. I was a 12-year-old busboy at a local restaurant, and one of the waitresses there, Arlene, just gave the busboys fits. She treated us like the dirty dishes and the food scraps and the ashtrays that we cleaned off of the tables. Every other waitress was nice to us, but not Arlene. And so, so we talked about her a lot behind her back. And, and I don't remember what triggered it, but one day I lit into her with a tongue lashing I didn't even know I was capable of. I had never talked to an adult like that before, would never talk to an adult like that since. I don't remember my words, but I know that they were mean. I don't know if I cussed her, but I may have. Ralphie's verbal tirade as he was beating the snot out of the bully Scut Farkas in a Christmas story, that had nothing on me. I mean, a number of people heard my tirade, and everybody was shocked because I was a nice boy. I mean, I was a good kid, a hard worker. I was a churchgoer. No sooner was I finished spewing my venom at Arlene than I marched back to the kitchen to tell my boss that I was quitting before he had time to fire me. And then I pulled off the crummy black bow tie I had to wear for that job, and I stormed out the back door, and tell you the truth, I felt kind of smug. I mean, I was kind of proud of myself, you know, until... until I heard that Arlene cried for hours. Now, I didn't tell my mom, but it's a small town. My mom heard. And she did the worst thing she could possibly do to punish me. She made me go back to the restaurant and apologize to everyone. It was rare for me to disappoint my mother, but I disappointed her then because she thought I was a better boy than I was. She thought I was a Christian boy. But on that day, I played the hypocrite. Unlike Jesus with the Pharisees, what I said to Arlene didn't come out of a place of love. It didn't come out of a place of truth. It didn't come out of an understanding that had all of the facts to work with, nor out of the hope that what my words might do some good for her in the long run. What I said and did to Arlene came out of this dark and angry place in my soul that I was blind to until I poured it out on Arlene. After that pathetic display, people who knew me would have thought, what a hypocrite. He pretends to be one thing, but I guess he's another. Hypocrite. It's the word that comes from the theater. Originally, it had neither negative or positive connotations. It was a neutral word, a theater word. It was a word that was used to describe an actor playing a part, playing someone he was not. You know, like a Tom Hanks, who, who I think is the greatest actor of my generation anyway. I mean, there's some good ones, right? But Hanks, man, best actor. I remember one time I made my case to Dana. Uh, you know why Tom Hanks is the best? Because he can play a multitude of roles and be so stinking believable in every one of them, whether he's a Forrest Gump or a Captain Miller or an attorney with AIDS or a gangster or a little kid in a man's body or, or a stranded castaway or a reluctant spy or a lonely dad from Seattle or a Washington Post editor or just an ordinary guy like Larry Crown. She, she agreed. The original sense of the word, in the original sense, Tom Hanks is the consummate hypocrite. An actor playing someone he is not. And to call him a first-rate hypocrite would have been a compliment of the highest order. It would have been the equivalent of giving him a standing ovation, an Oscar award. But by Jesus' time, the word hypocrite 
started toting a lot of negative baggage. It became a bad thing. In the theater, hypocrisy was fine. It was an art form, even. But in real life, it was bad news. In real life, hypocrisy became associated with terms like insincere and phony and fake. Calling someone a hypocrite was an insult. It was the equivalent of giving somebody the Bronx cheer. So Jesus was not paying the scribes and the Pharisees any compliments in our text. And he, and he maybe could have paid them some because the Pharisees weren't all bad. In fact, they were very good in many ways. They were zealous to keep Greek and Roman thought from, from perverting their beloved Jewish faith. They were law lovers, law keepers, law teachers. They are the tithers and the deacons and the Sunday school teachers. They're at church every time the doors are open. They're the ones who maybe even have a key. Jesus gives them their due in our text when he says they are seated in Moses' chair. So when it comes to Moses' law, do what they tell you. Pharisees aren't all bad. Some are quite good, but others, in a phrase Mark Twain once coined, are good in the worst sense of the word. Hypocrites. And in Matthew 23, Jesus exposes the hypocrisy of these scribes and Pharisees. In stark metaphors, Jesus called them to task for their arrogant, skin-deep spirituality. It's like he reached up into their souls, flicked on the light, and exposed all the darkness in there, all the hypocrisy in there for all of us to see. For one thing, they didn't practice what they preached. Do whatever they tell you and observe it, said Jesus, but don't do what they do because they don't practice what they preach. They couldn't if they wanted to because to ensure that Israel would remain separate and uncorrupted by these Roman occupiers, the scribes and Pharisees over a period of, of years added hundreds of restrictions and burdens to the law. The law now was no longer liberating, it was stifling. Rather than being the wings that would give Israel flight, the law became like quicksand. And Jesus put it like this, they tie up heavy loads that are hard to carry and put them on people's shoulders, but they themselves aren't willing to lift a finger to help them. The purpose of the law was to draw Israel into a meaningful and joyful relationship with and that they needed God and his mercy. But instead of focusing on these larger purposes, the scribes and Pharisees actually believed that, you know, they could keep this law, and to help them keep it in specifics, they added all kinds of trivia and minutia. So instead now of just being a people whose word is their bond, they came up with these elaborate ways of swearing oaths. In, instead of focusing on these large issues of justice and mercy and faithfulness, they started counting every seed in their bins so they could give the Lord an exact tithe. Instead of focusing on developing a pure heart, they decided they'd find fancy ways of washing one's hands and body. They majored on the minors, missed the majors, Jesus put it this way, they strained out a gnat and gobbled up a, and gulped down a camel. They didn't practice what they preached, hypocrisy. Another thing, they were more concerned about looking good than being good. They wore fancy clothes as a show of their spirituality because they wanted to be noticed. They wanted to look good. You heard the word phylacteries in our text. Phylacteries were these, these little boxes that would hold scripture verses. The scribes and Pharisees, Jesus said, wore large ones. And they didn't just wear fringes on their robe. Jesus said they wore long ones. Phylacteries and fringes, supposed to be things on the robe that would remind Israel of God's law, but the scribes and Pharisees were using them to make fashion statements. To make, look at me, look how righteous and perfect I am. They wanted to appear impressive. They wanted to appear spiritual. They wanted to appear imposing. They're the kind of folks who in our day might have hired image consultants. You see the movie some years ago, The Kid? Bruce Willis plays an image consultant in that movie, and near the end of the film, his alter ego kid tells him he finally figured out what an image consultant does. He said, you help people lie about who they really are so they can pretend to be someone else. That's many of the scribes and Pharisees. They look good on the outside, prosperous, chic, important, but Jesus doesn't look at their clothes. He looks at their hearts, and he calls them a bunch of hypocrites. Clean on the outside, but inside, full of dead men's bones, full of greed and self-indulgence, whitewashed tombs, 
unclean on the inside, hypocrites. And then this, they also considered themselves superior to others and they were quick to pull rank. They were all about titles. You know people who are all about titles. Now you can call me rabbi, or you can call me teacher, or you can call me father, but you better call me something that demonstrates I am better than you are. Who's your daddy? I'm your daddy. That's the way they demanded that others give them seats of honor in the synagogues, in the banquets. The scribes and Pharisees walked around acting like like God and wanting the deference that only God deserves, Jesus said, hypocrites. They were the kind of folks who Paul would write about in 1 Corinthians 13, who, because they had no real true love for God and for others, were really just sounding gongs and clanging cymbals, all noise, no substance. They loved their position, they loved their power, and not much else. And Jesus took them to task for it. There's a part, I'll admit it, there's a part, there's this sinful part of me that kind of likes this chapter a lot. I mean, who doesn't enjoy seeing big shots cut down to size? Seeing them when they're, when, when they're brought to light, seeing them blow up in pomposity and contempt when they're shown for who they really are. What's not to love about that? I mean, don't, don't you kind of dig it when somebody goes off on your least favorite politician? And what about some team or organization that you despise? Don't you love it when somebody gives them a comeuppance? Am I right? Who doesn't enjoy seeing somebody just stick it to the man? Until. Until you are the man. And Jesus is talking to you. Look at the first verse of our text. Then Jesus spoke to the crowds and to the disciples Every one of us in this room is either a disciple or part of the crowd. Jesus is talking to us. Now come verse 13, he's going to direct his talk directly to the scribes and the Pharisees. But these words, those words too, still meant for our ears. Jesus doesn't say these things in our earshot so that we can pile on the hypocrites. He says them so that we will take a good hard look at our own lives and our own hypocrisy. I'm guessing there are a few hypocrites in the room today, am I right? Are you one of them? Here's a quick little test. Do you practice everything you preach? How about, instead of asking you, how about ask your spouse or your kids or your social group? I think they'd be more objective, don't you? Do you practice what you preach? Do you value looking good more than being good? Here's a simple test for that. What is most important to you, looking Christian or living Christian? I love this older Stephen Curtis Chapman song in which he sings, Well, I got myself a T-shirt that says what I believe. I got letters on my bracelet to serve as my ID. I got the necklace and the keychain and almost everything a good Christian needs. I got a little Bible magnets on my refrigerator door and a welcome mat to bless you when you walk across my floor. I got a Jesus bumper sticker and an outline of a fish stuck on my car. And even though this stuff's all well and good, I cannot help but ask myself, what about the change? What about the difference? What about the grace? What about forgiveness? What about a life that's showing I'm undergoing the change? Anyone here whose appearance and accessories are more Christian than your heart? And another hypocrisy check, do you feel superior to anyone today? My guess is that most every one of us in this room have already looked at somebody we crossed paths with in church today and thought, well, at least I'm better than her. Have felt superior to someone. Anybody think you're superior? Maybe because of the church you attend or because of the car you drive or because of the places you shop or because of the neighborhood you live in, or the clothes that you wear, or the social group you're in, or the title that you carry. When it comes to titles, hey, nobody is worse than us preacher types. I'm serious. You know, you can call me reverend, or you can call me father, or you can call me doctor, or you can call me bishop, but you just show me the respect that I deserve. I could tell you about a lot of preachers like that. But then I'd be acting superior myself. So are there any hypocrites here today besides me? 
Jesus isn't just preaching Matthew 23 for the sake of the Pharisees. He's preaching to us, to his church. Have you ever noticed that when you try to invite a lost person or some badly bruised Christian or out-of-church Christian to come to church, how many of you have ever had somebody say, no thanks, the church is full of hypocrites? Hey, those people aren't the only ones who are concerned about the hypocrisy in the church. Jesus is too, and thus our text this morning. Kind of stings a little, doesn't it? But Jesus' word to us hypocrites is more than a stinging word. It's a healing word. If you have ears to hear, Jesus' word stirs you to be relentlessly and ruthlessly honest with yourself about your own hypocrisies. Jesus' word also makes clear that we are helpless to save and fix ourselves. His words drive us to a gospel remedy. The Pharisees couldn't keep the law. We can't either. We need grace, grace, and more grace, and God gives us a couple of grace gifts to heal us from our hypocrisies. The first gift is humility. Listen to Jesus in verse 12. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. And Jesus doesn't mean self-degradation here. Is there anything worse than false humility? Humility is thinking of yourself less and God more. This is a call to honest self-awareness. It's a call to live a life deeper than appearances, larger than a bunch of strangling rules, and more authentic than preaching one thing and living another. The call to humility is a call to live life rooted in God and in God's grace. It's a call to recognize our helplessness and God's sufficiency. It's a call to remember that we cannot save ourselves and fix ourselves in our own strength. Jesus' call to humble ourselves is a call to remember that God is God. We are not It's a call to remember that we are on equal footing with all of our brothers and sisters in the human race. All of us are needy. All of us depend on God's grace. We need His grace to save us. We need His grace to transform us. None of us are all we could be. We are all in the middle of our own sanctification, and that ought to keep us humble, and that ought to keep us yielding to God's shaping work in our lives And it should keep us humble enough to trust God to do the shaping in other people's lives without our condemnation or our meddling interference. Humility is the first gift of grace that God gives to heal us of our hypocrisy and self-sufficiency. And the second gift of grace is uh, gratitude, which is a kissing cousin of humility. Humble people are grateful people, just the way it goes. They know how needy they are, and they know how dependent they are on the grace of God. John Fisher writes, No need to judge other people when you're thankful for who you are. No need to measure yourself by or compare yourself to others when you're thankful for what God has done in your life. No need to stand at the door of the kingdom of God and keep others out when you're just thankful that you got in. You are not obsessed with what other people think of you when you're overwhelmed with the fact that God thinks of you. You don't have to try for the highest place when you're already grateful for the lowest. You don't have to make a show of spirituality when you're thankful that you have received the Spirit, and you don't have to clothe yourselves in holy robes when you already have been clothed with righteousness. Jesus' grace can heal our hypocrisies. Jesus did not die for our sins and rise from the dead so we could become a better version of who we already are in the flesh. He died, he rose for us so we could become a new creation, new people saved by grace and dressed not in our own self-righteousness but in the righteousness that Christ gives us. Humble yourself. Jesus makes it known. If you don't, sooner or later God will. Humble yourself and be grateful. These are the gifts that heal us of our hypocrisies. And it's a beautiful thing, isn't it, when God changes a hypocrite's heart when he turns that arrogance into humility, when he turns that judgmental spirit into love. Sybil Cannon recalls an experience from her teenage years. Her uncle Chester was an alcoholic. In Iuka, Mississippi, he was known as the town drunk. When Sybil was 15, Uncle Chester and Aunt Maddie moved in to live with her and her family, and Sybil had become a Christian when she was a young girl. She dedicated herself to full-time Christian service. She was president of her youth group. She was at church every time the doors are open, and she could barely stand the sight of her uncle, let alone treat him kindly. Uncle Chester came to a revival service 
where Sybil was singing a solo. And when the evangelist at the end of the service asked all of those who were Christians to stand, Sybil proudly did so. And the next morning, as Uncle Chester was frying up the breakfast bacon, he sort of mumbled, Some people last night at church misunderstood the preacher's directions. He asked for all the Christians to stand, and a lot of people who aren't Christians stood up too. Sybil knew his comment was directed at her. It brought all of her bitterness to the surface. How dare you doubt my Christianity? Who are you to question me? Your wife has to support you. Everybody in Iuka laughs at you. You can't walk straight. You can't talk without slurring and slobbering. You smell like a gutter. I can't stand having you in our house. I can't stand seeing Aunt Maddie put up with you. Truth is, I can't stand you. Do you know what you are, Uncle Chester? You are a drunk. You're a lousy drunk. Well, Chester didn't look up from his frying pan, but he softly answered, Sybil, I know who I am, but do you know who you are? You know, it's never easy for the self-righteous, for the keep all the rules, make a good appearance hypocrite, never easy to see yourself for who she is. There's a blindness there. It's no coincidence that Jesus uses the word blind three times in Matthew 23 to describe scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. Odd, isn't it, that someone who is so desperately, who so desperately wants to be seen can't even see herself. But Uncle Chester's quiet comment opened Sybil's eyes, opened her eyes to herself, and it changed her life. In grace, God humbled that arrogant little girl And she realized that with all of her claims to Christianity and her parading her religion, she'd never shown Uncle Chester Christian love. So after school that day, she rushed home. She found her uncle, she asked for his forgiveness, and that night they went to church together. Sybil walked down the aisle again that evening, this time to confess to the church that she'd been a Pharisee and a hypocrite, confident of her own spirituality, but never seeing herself clearly. Harry Fosdick put it this way many of us are like a rock in the woods covered with trailing vines externally attractive but turn us over and what scampering of unclean crawling things to their holes Sybil finally saw the hypocrisy in her own life she repented she humbled herself she received God's grace and became much more grateful joyful and useful Christian Expose your hypocrisy to the light of Christ. Repent, humble yourself, and let Jesus shape you into a much more joyful, grateful, useful Christian.